Good morning, church. From one novel to the next, right? You think they were mad at me the other day about the, the post about the point? So, I have just been blocked on Facebook and everything else. Okay, that's enough of that. So, all right, good morning, church. Hey, a couple things. Uh, tomorrow night, celebrate recovery. Hey, 55 people here last Sunday night. That is amazing. Some new folks coming. And then, Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Pastor Bill Evans back there is going to take us through Genesis. We're going to start and we're going to utilize him. He'll be part of our message today because uh, we are on our last part of our recovery. Uh, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, going to Genesis. Also on the 14th, right? August 14th, uh, we're going to be doing a celebration of life uh, service for Erica's mom. Uh, if you want to come, masks will be required because of the health issues of some of the family members, and we want to respect that. Uh, so uh, we are going to provide church. We're going to provide the lunch for everybody. Uh, so we'll be taking up a little offering for that to help out. Uh, and so they are, they're going to have a, a graveside service with the immediate family that are going to come over. We're going to feed them. Then we're going to come in and have a memorial service. Uh, so if you're free that day, we'd like to help with the food and passing out stuff and just uh, being here to support. Because remember, this is not for those who have moved on in heaven. It's those for those that are grieving and are still here for us to show support and love to. So, uh, Amen. my problem is I have empathy that goes off the chart. And I look at Eric and I, I hurt. And then we're all, how are you doing? And, and that's the worst question. You just hug her. You don't have to say nothing. Look in her eyes and tell her you love her. And we know she's going through it. Let's pray. Father, he's coming for you this morning. Lord, knowing you're a mighty God. I'm so thankful for your love, your mercy, and your grace that falls upon us. Lord, I lift up uh, the Montez family. I lift up Erica's sisters. Father, I ask you to continue to touch them. Speak your love into their ears. With every embrace, with every moment that you just pour out your love upon them. Father, we know if other people are going through some difficult times, struggling with the problems with relationships, the problems with finances, the problems of folks that are sick, Lord. But you're the great physician. You're capable of doing anything above what we ask. So this morning we are asking, Lord, that you would fall upon this place. Let the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit be felt. For every man, woman, and child that walks upon this property because it's been set apart, sanctified for you, Lord. This is your place. And these are your people, my brothers, my sisters. Father, we know those who can't be here because of health issues. We put your, them in your hands. For those outside, those watching on Facebook and Instagram, Father, we ask you to minister to them. And most of all, Lord, we ask you to fall upon us with your spirit that will be your men, your women, your sons, your daughters, to proclaim the truth. Your son, Jesus Christ, will be lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your eyes with us as we do our flag salutes. Because you don't ask me this time, it took me back to elementary school when we would get excited for the teacher to pick us and leave the whole class. But let's go ahead and place our right hand over our heart, and we're going to pledge of allegiance to the flag. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Keep your right hand over your heart, and we're going to pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. And to the Savior whose kingdom stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and liberty to all who believe. And we'll keep our right hand over our heart, and we pledge allegiance to the Bible. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart 
that I might not sin against God. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started with one of our favorite parts, which is worship. And Bill even said it this morning. Bill, our sound guy. Um, he said, worship is a powerful weapon. And yes, it is. It's a powerful weapon when we are being attacked spiritually. When things are just not going well in our life. In worship, God fights our battle. So this morning, we're going to pray and we're going to worship and we're going to praise His name. Amen.
things, Jesus. Thank you, God, Lord, for letting us awake this morning, Father God. For letting us gather, Father Jesus, Lord. Where two or three are gathered, Father, you are there. And you are with us this morning, Jesus, Lord. We surrender everything we are, Father God. All the burdens we have, Jesus, we give to you. You give us new strength, Father, Lord. You lift us, Jesus, Lord, when we are down. The road, uh, the road to recovery based on the Beatitudes. And, I, I'm gonna, and they do them. I'm like, oh, it's cool. They already have them up here for me already. So like, they knew that I needed these. I want to read those instead of reading the whole Beatitudes to you through uh, Matthew, but I always want to read through each one of these and uh, what step it is part of. So, realize I am not God, and I am powerless to control my tendencies to do the wrong thing. That is, my life is unmanageable. That's uh, step one. That's the first of the R, is realizing that we're not God. And the Beatitude goes with that. It's happy are those that know they are spiritually poor. Man, when it came to find out that I was broke in this world, not money-wise, because see, when I was young, I was taught that you had to, to make so much to become a man. You had to prove yourself by what you earned. And it had nothing to do about what God wanted. I always think about when Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The problem with a lot of us is we have put away the childish things. We're still out there running and gunning and thinking it's all a big party. And it's costing you a lot. You are spiritually broke. Or some of you are just broke in. But you are, but you are spiritually poor. The E. Earnestly believe that God exists. That I matter to Him. And that He has the power to... Re Help me recover. That is step two. And it says, Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You have to come to the realization that God's the only one that can fix you. Amen. I fix myself a lot, but I've messed things up a lot. <laughs> but so saying two steps forward, one step back, you don't get very far like that. But my problem is I take one step forward and always end up three or four steps backwards. <laughs> C. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. That's step three. Happy are the meek. It's Matthew 5, 5. You know, and when we think about meekness as weakness, it's not. It has nothing to do about weakness. You know, you, you take a horse, and, and growing up in the Central Valley, I was lucky enough to be around these guys that rode all the time, and and we get out there and do stupid things and try to ride these horses to break them. And you've not lived until you try to break a horse. Because uh, they don't want you on their back. At least they're not like the bulls. The bulls definitely don't want you on their back. And they will eat you. <laughs> and they will, they will let you know they don't want you there. The, the horse will try to do everything to keep from hurting you. Uh, they'll step over you. And, and every once in a while you will get kicked as you go off of them. But once you break that horse, that horse is now meek. He's under control. He has the same power, same majestic strength that he had before, beautiful animals. But now he's under control. So meekness is power under control. And so we need to understand that God wants us to be under control. Now, Tuesday I got in a dark spot. So I let somebody in this world take away my meekness. And we'll talk more about that. Oh, openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. That's step four and five. And happy are the pure in heart, Matthew 5, 8. And I like that because, you know what? If nothing else, I want my heart to be right with God. I want a pure heart. I want him to take out, like it says in Ezekiel, that heart of stone. And give me a heart of And he did that for me. I was like so blown away that he took someone who's so hardened to the world and so ugly. And he gave me a heart full of empathy and compassion. So we need to openly examine. Did I miss something? Did I miss C? No, I, we did that. 
Yeah. E earnestly. Huh? I'm on V now, right? V. Yeah. Help me, guys. I should probably look up there. I'm like, I'm printing this stuff up. I'm getting a book. All right. D, voluntarily submit to any and all changes God wants to make in my life. And humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Steps six and seven. You know, you can camp out here for like uh, the rest of your life. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. Matthew 5, 6. That's step seven. If you try to ask God to start changing things. And you humbly ask him to remove these de defects. Now, I know none of you have defects like I have, because I have some serious ones. But God will start working on them if you allow him, and you start examining yourself, and you take that inventory. E, evaluate my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me, and make amends for harm I have done to others when possible. Except when to do... So you would harm them or others. That's step eight and nine. It says, happy are the merciful. Five, seven. Happy are the peacemakers. Matthew 5, 9. R. This is what we talked about last week. Reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and, the, and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to follow his steps that's steps 10 and 11 and then we come to the why my buddy was talking about doing a whole sermon on why why do we do what we do but this why is amazing this why is the whole sermon of learning to do this will help you yield myself to God to be used to bring the good news to others both by my example and my words that's step 12 and happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires or persuaded a person God wants you to yield to him let's pray father I need you right now just to intercede and to continue to move upon my life Father, you know the things that I went through this week, the struggles, the battles, the heartaches. But Father, I thank you for the blessings you brought forth. I thank you for your mercy and your grace. Now, Lord, as we go through this together and we try to understand where we're at, help us to be the men and women that will be used by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Learning to yield yourself to God is the, the, the key thing right here. It's not just, just let him have his way with you. And when you finally do that, when you finally allow God to use your strengths and your abilities, then you're going to be a blessing to others. And once you get out of your own way, then God will use you. What happens is we get so caught up about us and we're so absorbed about who we are. We're so self-absorbed trying to take care of things and fix things and, and try to be who we think we should be instead of being who God's called us to be. Now, he's given each one of you strengths, and he's given you the ability to do something. But the main thing that we have to do is learn to camp out right here and yielding ourselves to him. Allowing him to use our weaknesses and the pains that we go through. To use our life that we've been through to develop, to become the men and women he's called us to be. we got to stop being self-absorbed, like I said earlier. It's not about my needs, my hurts, my problems. You need to start saying, how can I help others? And that's what Paul was talking about. When I was a child, I spake as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, have you ever watched a kid in a, in a store? Or in, 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 in the... Mine. 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 And then try to take it from him. Oh, I watched my... my uh, Grandsons, it's an amazing thing to watch. <laughs> Chase has got his nemesis, and his name is Levi. But they're best of buds. <laughs> Levi wakes up, Chase, where's Chase? He FaceTimes him, but they get together and they're, they're frenemies. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And Levi will get Chase's cup because he likes it. And <laughs> Chase just goes crazy. He takes it from him and Levi starts smacking him. And the fight is on. So I looked behind the couch the other day and I look, and there's all these toys. Chase hid them so Levi was coming over so he wouldn't get his toys. Well, Levi was up on Grandma's shoulder and he looked over and saw all these toys. And then Chase showed up and the fight was on. But it was a battle. But yet they love each other and they care of each other. And But the thing is this, as they were battling for it, it's the same thing we're battling for in this world. God loves us so much. He wants to give us all these toys. All the things that we need. If we just yield to him. And in, in a little while later, he'll let Chase, will let Levi play with his toys. Now Levi is not so much letting Chase play with his toys yet. So, so, you know, but Chase will share. So we're going to wrap this up understand that we need to say that it becomes about something more than us. When Paul said, I became a man. I put away childish things. And I've, I come to the conclusion, I understood this, because when, when I was young, it was all about me. I was self-absorbed about where the party was out, what the things I was doing, how I was going to spend my money, what I was going to do with it. It was all about me, 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 until it became we, we, we. All the way home, said that little piggy, right? <laughs> became us. i got to be careful with some of these words that come out of my mouth. Became us. All of us. It had become about them and not about me. And so as I started understanding that, it was no longer about what I wanted in this world, but what we needed in this world, what she needed. And again, it's hard as you're growing up to see we're selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed. We don't want anybody to take our toys. You know, I love that bumper sticker that said, he that dies with most toys dies. <laughs> They're going to squabble over, the kids are going to fight over, and it's going to be, you know, crazy times. It, it, he who dies with those toys does not win. He dies. We're not getting out of your lives. Okay, so we're going to try to wrap this up. And the first couple of things we're going to talk about, how God can use our pain, and then how I can take my life and use it to help others. So if you're looking at your things, why has God allowed my pain? Well, there's many reasons for this, but uh, we're going to try to point out four this morning. He has given me free will and if you know i am a free will baptist i know it's an oxymoron with a lot of baptists so how could you be baptist and have free will a lot of people are like oh i don't get that but but listen i love this he's given us choice we get to choose now he has given you the ability to choose but you're not free from the consequences that you chose uh the, the scripture is that's should be 11 uh well we'll read that one right there I'm giving you the choice between God's blessing or God's curse. The blessing, if you obey my commandments, uh, and it should be Deuteronomy 11, 26, all the way down to 29. Uh, my bad for not proofreading my typing. But choices, listen, God created you in his image to make you like him, and that is to be, have choice. Now, he could have cookie cutter stamped us all out, and we could all be going to the same, look the same, but that's not what God wanted. He wanted individuals to worship him and to love him and to serve him. You know, because he could have said, okay, we're going to pray every day at 9, 12, you know, 4, and we all get up and do that. But that's not what God's called us to do. We're not a bunch of puppets. See, God's made us uniquely different for a reason. And God wants to use you, and that free will that you got makes you have to make choices. Now, I have made some dumb, dumb choices. You know, yesterday when I was here, uh, I started looking at videos and I wanted to play a bunch of them because there's so many uh, dumb choices people make and there's uh, some crazy things out there. People do some stupid stuff. And I thought, well, I better not do that because we'll be here a while and we'll be laughing too hard. <laughs> but God wants you to love him voluntarily. You need to choose to love God. That's the free will part. You can't, God does not choose anybody to go to hell. We choose that destination ourselves. See, the free will can be, this be a blessing or a curse. Now, I don't know about you, I really never really woke up in the morning, Gilbert, and said, today I really want to be cursed. I didn't wake up Tuesday morning and say, I'm going to post something on Facebook that's going to make me get in the flesh. 
I woke up like I normally do and said, God, I want your blessing. But then I forgot about John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I posted this little thing on Facebook. I thought, this is so cool. This sounds really good because we have all this coin shortage going on. And this guy said, hey, I can fix this coin shortage. You know, and he goes, I'm from the Dame Ramsey School of Thought. I pay cash for everything. But I do have my debit card. So when it comes down, it's going to be like 26 cents or 36 cents. What I'll do is I will use my debit card to make the, the change. Instead of them giving me a little debit card and, and put it on that, I'll make them use this in the bank. So start or use it as a, as a credit card and they're going to charge 2%. And so I'll make the banks really pay. And someone, not someone, just several, because I post this. I reposted it like, if you know me, I've, I'm on part of, I don't know how many groups. All of a sudden, people started questioning my Christianity. How can I call myself a Christian because I said that this is what we ought to do? First, it wasn't my words. It was somebody else's words. I just thought it was a good idea. And sometimes things sound good up here and look good up here. And by the time I type them in there, they're not so good. But when they question my calling, that's when I lost it. He calls them trolls. They show up and just kind of stir up stuff. And so a couple different different guys who I do know want to know how I could be a pastor and post that. I guess the same way how I could wear a mask looks like that. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I do stir the pot, but I got mad. There were some other issues going on and some things happening that just all of a sudden I got in the flesh. If they would have been in front of me, it would have been the first time in years that I wanted to punch somebody right in the mouth. I, I was angry. And I had not been in a dark spot like that in years. Now, I have people flip me off all the time because I, the way I drive or I don't drive right. And I, I, I get people upset with some of the things I said. I, it's usually just like water off a duck's back. But something struck me wrong. After 29 years of pastoring, someone's going to say, how can you call yourself a pastor? And I, I just, I deleted the messages. I deleted them. And I got in the fetal position and cried. <laughs> Didn't get on Facebook very much for a few days. Had my feelings hurt. <clears throat> See, I had free will to post that, but I wasn't able to understand that uh, there's consequences of things I do. So I thought this was a really, really good idea. Well, other people thought differently and they let me know. And so I took my hurt and I got all upset and kind of feel like a victim and instead of being a victor. And see, that's the problem a lot of us. We're victims instead of victors. We allow people to rob us of our joy, steal us of our happiness, and try to kill everything that we've done. You might have been hurt deeply by a parent, a, a former spouse, a teacher, a friend, or some knucklehead on Facebook. Get over it. Build a bridge. Get over it. But God can take that hurt, and God can take that wrong that's happened to you and start building on it. And see, what God says, you have free will. You have freedom to choose, but you don't have freedom for the consequences. And so when you see this and you figure this out, he says, how many wake up and say, I want to take a blessing today? All of us. Who wakes up and says, I want to curse? None of us. But the problem is when you don't obey God's commandments. James said it this way, to them that know it to do good and do it to not, it is sin. And that's just missing the mark. Now, guess what? I miss the mark every day. Different things that I'm shooting for, I miss the mark. And so I understand that sometimes I bring, because of my free will, some of these curses upon myself. I'm glad God didn't say, okay, we're just going to be cookie cutters, this, 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 this. But we all have freedom and a free will to choose and free reign to serve God because he wants that from us. The problem is we sometimes want God to take away other people's free will. So you, you, why do you let them do that to me, God? They have free will. See, we want to pick and choose free will for people. I, I like this. this is one of my friends said this, this is, we believe in free will, but we don't want people to practice it. We want them to do what we want them to do when we want them to do it. 
That's called marriage. No, I'm just <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. I, like I didn't know, okay? So point out the obvious, okay? Captain Obvious, all right? Thanks, Shannon. Appreciate you. You're taking Dino's spot, you know? Come on. <laughs> it's all right. He uses us. What is it? Number two. He uses to get our attention. Why is he allowed the pain light to get our attention? Pain is that warning light, that alarm. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, that's uh, that's your uh, ringtone, right, Jeff? Yes. Yes. Right. Only one I can hear. That's all I can hear. <laughs> so you hear that? Eh, it's not a warning. It's just just phone going off. So. So the thing is this, that buzzer, that warning light, there's something wrong. When you start feeling the pain, there's that problem, there's something happening. You get the depression, anxiety. And like I said, I got really depressed over the way these people talked to me. And I thought it was wrong and sad that it happened. But, you know, God got our, God doesn't use a megaphone to get our attention at times. But sometimes in the pain, he allows it. Look at the Proverbs 20, verses 30. It says, sometimes it takes... A painful situation to make us change our ways. You know, and this is a prayer I pray for other people that have been, that have been and if you guys remember, any, anybody here remember Bart? Yeah. You remember Bart? Gina says, Bart's using again. Well, he's not, right now he's not. This has been years ago. I said, okay, let's pray. I said, God, put Bart flat on his back. Lay him out. The only place he can look up is to you. Knucklehead has a heart attack a few hours later. Like, oh, dude, be careful how you pray. <laughs> but God got a hold of him, amen? He quit putting that meth in his arm. He said, God got his attention. You know, it's a year ago that you had your heart attack, uh, Reza. So God has a way of getting a hold of us and to get our attention. And through that painful situation, Bart was on his back in the hospital getting stents put in. And he realized that I need to quit using it. And so sometimes we need to understand God allows us to go through these things to get our attention. What makes you, motivates you to change? In, in, in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, it says this, I am glad, not because it hurts you, but because the pain turns you to God. <coughs> I was kind of sad for Bart, but then I was glad for Bart. I was sad that I, oh man, did I pray like that and this really happened? Or did God just say, okay, I got a hold of your heart here, let's get a hold and get your attention. And so, it got his attention really quick. And so we know that God will grab a hold of us. God will take it to us. Think about Jonah. God told him to go one way and he went the other way. And God arranged a, a nice Mediterranean uh, cruise for him in the belly of a fish. Right? And he's asleep, and the ship's going, and these people are freaking out. And they, they said, he goes, I, I'm the problem. Just cast me over. And so they threw Jonah over, and he got swept up and uh, into a fish's belly. And he was in it there for a few days, and three, three days or so. And in Jonah chapter 2, verse 7, it says this. When I had lost all hope, I once again turned my thoughts to the Lord. I like that. When's the last time you lost all hope? Turn your thoughts to God. Turn things to God and ask God to help you. Can you imagine this? After he did that, uh, something irritated the, the fish and he threw up Jonah onto the shore. After being in there with that seaweed wrapped around him and probably smelled like fish and, and after the seaweed all over him and he's probably pale white from being in there with that salt water. You know, all wrinkly and you know, being in the water, it's just a, what an imagination, like, you, all of a sudden, you're out there and you're fishing, like, not much bite, and all of a sudden, this thing comes flying at you, and this guy lands on the shore. Hey, hey, buddy, which way's Nineveh? <laughs> yeah, I want to do what God wants. I want that blessing, amen? So if you end up in a belly fish, it's your own fault. That's the moral of that whole story. If you end up in a situation and the pain becomes real. Turn your thoughts to God. Turn your direction to Him. 
Three, God uses pain to teach me to depend upon him. Second Corinthians 1, 8 through 10 says, We were crushed and overwhelmed and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But it was good for then we put everything into the hands of God who could save us and he did help us. I like that too. It teaches me to depend on him and not on others. When I'm going through it and I'm struggling like I did the other day, I had to step back and I was blown away. I was told that over 400 people reached out to me. I'm like, wow, people do care. And the comments and, 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 and just reaching out and, and still people, they're, they're just reading it for the first time. And they're like, I got phone calls, I got texts, I got emails, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just glad those people weren't in front of me. I may not be here today. I'd be in my prison ministry right now. <laughs> I would be understanding that I would not be independent of him, but I was. I depended on my wife prayed with me and, and prayed for me. And, and uh, then God used some things. Other people who were going through it called me and wanted me to pray for them and talk to them. And I said, how in the world did I let someone get me that upset? They really don't know me. They know of me. But don't know me. The person that God has created. That God allowed his son to die for. That gave him a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. That I was falling apart. And I didn't need to. I just needed to depend upon him. God and his helpers to encourage me and send words of encouragement. Shannon reached out, I wanted to know if I wanted to get a burger. And I said, no, I want a biscuits and gravy, man. Come on, Shannon, why don't you offer me a burger? <laughs> but I appreciated that. <laughs> Psalms 119 verse 71 says this, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me for it taught me to pay attention to our laws. I'm glad I posted that because I didn't really know how much people cared. I, I was blown away. I, I was hurting. I, I was really in a dark spot. And I was so thankful that I did post that because you folks reached out to me. And in my pain, you became my comfort and my strength. And through your prayers, and through the prayers of my wife, and through God's word, I was able to get over it. It took a little while, but I was able to get over it. Pain is one of life's greatest teachers. It's like the guy went to the doctor, he was drinking, and he says, after I drink my tea, I get a sharp pain in my eye. The doctor says, take out the spoon, stupid. <laughs> it's a great teacher, pain is. They'll say, no pain, no gain. Pain is weakness leaving the body. All the stuff we teach these kids when we coach football and stuff, you know, just push through it. Well, sometimes you have to yield to God or let him take that pain. Yield to people and let God have his way. Number four, God allows pain to give me a ministry to others. Why does God do this? So that we, so that when others are in trouble and needing sympathy and encouragement we can pass on to them the same help and comfort God has given us 2 Corinthians 1 4 and you think about that who is the best person to help someone that's going through mental struggles a mental person like me a person is, is trying to get through rehab on shoulders has had shoulder injury and had surgery you seek out people who have been through it and what they did to help with recovery. Same with spiritual recovery. Seek out someone that's been through it a little bit. Social recovery. Drugs. You can find somebody and find out how they went through it. What got them through it. Who's the best person to help alcoholics? Someone who is an alcoholic. Someone who can tell you what it's like to be down and out. I used to, when we first started, I was a youth pastor for years and and uh, with Reza's dad, Parvis, we go down to the LA Missions and preach down there once a month. And uh, 
go beer commercial time, just reach out for all the gusto you can get. And we take the kids down there, and, and I remember uh, Joe and, and Nick and Ramin and the mirror were little guys, and we take them down to Skid Row and say, here, this is what you get when you want to you know, drink those beers and have fun. You know, and they look at these guys, they're like, they're pretty scared. These kids are resilient. They walk up to these guys on the street, start talking to them. You know, I can see sister, no, 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 come over here. These kids are out there, but uh, yeah, show them what life is. Show them that God's given you the tools to minister to others. When you've been through something, God wants you to understand. You can use that struggle, that hurt, that pain to help others. When you see your family hurting, you hurt along with them, don't you? Who can help a couple that's struggling, a couple that struggles? Me and my wife, we went through it for the first few years because I hadn't grown up yet. I was in the world and struggled and it was all because I got mad at the church and uh, mad because of what took place and I didn't understand it. I was young in the Lord. So I left the church for about three years and really went off the deep end. And there's a lot of times that uh, she didn't like me very much and I probably didn't like her either. She didn't like my drugs or my alcohol. My days, I would not come home. She didn't like that. She didn't like that I would come home and then I had any money left over. She remember going one Christmas, going on Christmas Eve to get the last Christmas tree there. It looked like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree once she got it home. It was a major problem. So when people tell me they, they don't like the wife very much, I can, I can relate to that. There was times I didn't like her because she was trying to take away my drugs and alcohol. She was wanting me to do things I didn't, shouldn't do. You know, we believe the death do his part. There's times that she wanted to kill me, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know what? We made a vow because we both came from broken homes that we did not want that for our children. And we worked through it. So if you're struggling in marriage, come see us. We can talk to you. We can help you. We can direct you. Remember I mentioned Joseph last week? You think about Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. And, and his dad kind of favored him a little bit and made him that coat of many colors. And the brothers were jealous. And, and he'd come beep up and down and check on his brothers. And they got mad at him. And, and they threw him in, in, into a, the ditch and, and uh, uh, took his coat. And, and they, they told his dad that he got eaten. They sold him off in slavery. <clears throat> told him he got eaten by a, a lion and, and uh I'd like to what a dysfunctional family huh <laughs> nothing new we still have families fighting like that and uh, the major problem here is that they were jealous of their brother because he had these visions and not that he just wasn't just sold off into slavery then he, he gets into to another family and he's serving uh Potiphar and, and uh, all of a sudden Potiphar's wife tries to sleep with him and and then she says, well, he says he didn't sleep with me. He goes, and I love his words. He says, how can I sin against God and my master? And he left. And when he left, he left his coat behind. And she cried, cried rape and got him thrown into prison. And, and again, there, he, you know, he all come down to it. And finally, through all that, if you read the story in Genesis, and we'll be reading it in Genesis 50, verse 20. is a great verse. His brothers are all around the table. And he is now overseeing everything because God had placed him in a place of authority. And this is what it says here in Genesis 50, 20. They intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. God never wasted her. God never wasted her. Reza said this a couple weeks ago. Hurt people hurt people. People who hurt hurt other people. Misery loves company. But if you take that hurt and what you've been through... We could come like Joseph and say, you know what? Okay, the world meant to hurt me this way, but God meant it for good. God's going to show me how to be used. So how do I use my pain to help others? 
That's what we talked about last week in Rome, or Rome, the step eight. First Peter chapter three verses fifteen says, "Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for you for the reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect." Listen, we need to be ready to give an answer. When a person says, how did you get sober? How, how did you do that? He said, I put in the work. You got to put in the work. You want to stay sober, you got to put in the work. You can take your experiences and start using them so that God can use you. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. If someone is overcome by sin, humbly help the him back unto the right path, remembering that next time it might be you who is in the wrong. Share each other's troubles and problems and obey our Lord's commands. Listen, notice that's a command. So I'm going to point out a couple, three things that will help us to do this. There's just suggestions that might help you. Very first thing you need to do is be humble. Not boastful. What's still saying is this. When you're sharing your story, all you're just telling, you're one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Be humble. You know, and we hear this, we're in all of us, we're all of us together, right? We hear that a lot now. Yeah, okay. Until some of your folks have walked in some of your shoes, they, they, they have no clue, right? A person who has never been through it can't understand. So, well, I don't understand it. And why they just can't stop. Why they can't quit? I just lost it. There we go. Why can't? Why do they allow this to happen? I don't know. The battle is real, but we need to be humble when you're on the road of recovery. I don't have it all together, but together we have it all. Me and my wife, Amen. And because we can play off each other's weaknesses and strengths, and she's a big part of who I am today because of that. The next thing is be real. Just be you. You know, we all have hurts and faults and habits and hang-ups. Uh, we all have been through it. Some things are different for others. God has a way to understand. Just be real. Be honest with the people around you that, hey, I'm struggling in these areas. I'm having a hard time with this. And don't lecture last person wants someone to do is put a big fat finger underneath their nose and say, listen, if you don't straighten up, you're going straight to hell. But if you come alongside of me, put your arm around and say, hey, you doing okay? Can I help you? Don't lecture people. They're already, they're already going through it. Ask them how you can help them. Share your story with them. Tell them how Christ has made a difference in your life. We want to make sure you share what happened to them. You can't force anybody into heaven and you can't force anybody into hell. So I'm going to ask you to take four challenge steps with me this week. If you've not yet committed your life to Jesus Christ, you need to do it today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time, the Bible says. Now. If you've never, ever received Christ as your Savior, it's that easy. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm a whosoever. I'm not a hooser, but a whosoever. <laughs> so what are you waiting for? What is it going to take? So, well, when I clean this up, when I do this, when I get better at that, when I get to this place, I will then do it. You'll never do it. Because you're never going to get there. Now is an acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait to fix something. Then do this. Write out your story. Take time. Put it down. And man, that, that testimony the other night, RC, that lady that gave her testimony, she had it all written out. And my gosh, what an amazing testimony. She went through it and then some. But God has brought her back and healed her and given her more than she ever had that the devil took away. Write it out. Look at it. Read it. Do it. It may be ugly, but it's your story. That way you can see what you've been through. And it won't change because it's going to be on paper. 
Then commit yourself to a church, whether it's our church, another church, but you need to commit yourself to church, family, and support. Today, a group of guys are going to leave here. You're going to see Keith. We're going to go over and help Patricia pack her stuff so she can move to Oregon and be with her daughter. Help be there. Be with people. Support people. Uh, we started off, my wife started off being a, a Sunday school teacher. And I started off being a Sunday school teacher. And then I became a youth worker. And then I became a youth pastor. And then I got a bus ministry. And then one day they said, hey, would you come over and fill in? at the church over there without a pastor. And so uh, as soon as Gabe's ready, I'll be able to step down and I'll have to quit filling in. Because I've only been filling in for 29 years. And one of the guys probably questioned my Christianity and myself. <laughs> I'm not permanent yet. Just a temp. I'm just a temp. But commit yourself. I'll never forget, we were doing a church cleanup. And I walk in, and we had our, uh, we were in the, the area where the kids' bathroom's at. And there I walk in, my wife is just bawling her eyes out. She's down there in that commode where the little primary kids are at, and she's washing that toilet, and she's crying. I said, I'm afraid to go over. Is it that bad? Is it, you know, because little kids don't got good aim, amen? Some of you big guys either I'm seeing in there. So. <laughs> Step up a little closer, will you? <laughs> just being real honest, okay? And she's bawling her eyes out. And I walked, honey, you okay? She's just thinking, God's allowing her to do work for him. To serve him just by just humbling and washing the bathroom for the kids. Scrubbing those toilets. If y'all want to get humbled, come scrub some toilets. <laughs> There's always something to do. There's always something to do. There's always someone to help. There's always someone to minister to. And number four, ask God to give you somebody you can share your story with. Share the good news of how God has made a difference in your life. I've shared a story over and over again. We went to this little through old Baptist church there in Norwalk. My wife started going back to church. I'd run away from myself I uh, worked for Harris Ranch and I uh, got fired because of some of the stupid things I did and things I was in the world. I was a working addict. Uh, I was doing the hiring and every time I'd hire somebody uh, for a certain group of people, I would get an ounce of coke. And I thought, man, I could make money. And then I became my best customer. And it ended up costing my job. I went to work for Viking and worked on getting sober. And then I said to my wife, if I just leave Fresno, we just leave for the valley and I move back to LA, we'll be good. We'll be good. And she started going back to church. I'll never forget, she started going back to church, that church that I told you I got hurt by. And I would be so angry when I had one car at the time. And sometimes I would go pull the coil wire so she couldn't go. Other times I'd wait till she's in the shower and then I would jump in the car and start driving off. One time she got so mad, uh, she came out and there was a branch there. She hit the windshield, shattered the windshield, but I drove off and did my thing and went and got high. And I told her, listen, if we just let me move, I'll go stay with my parents till we find a place and you move down. It took us six months to find a place and we ended up in Cudahy where I started off uh, as a kid. And uh, it didn't take long before she started going back to church while she was up there. And then uh, during the revival, the pastor said, she said, well, we're, we are, we're moving back to L.A. He goes, well, I have a brother-in-law that has a church that pastors in Norwalk. And so we got it. And uh, so we got started going to church with her. And at that time, I was working for Viking. And I... Uh, we would bid our jobs by our, our numbers, so I made sure I bid my job that I took. I worked on Sundays, and I was supposed to be off on Fridays and Saturdays, and I always got to work Fridays and Saturdays because, you know, overtime. And if you know anything about Viking back in the day, you'd work all the overtime you wanted, and again, if you heard my story earlier, I said to prove that I was a man, I had to make so much money. And I had come out of a job already working, you know, seven days a week, you know, I was a workaholic. 
Not only was I an addict, but I spent all my time working. And when I wasn't working, I was getting loaded. I was getting loaded at work, getting loaded after work. Well, then, you know. And I put a wedge between us. So we moved down here. And I did really good for a while. But wherever I went, there I was. And these same kind of people found me out. Or I found them out. And I started using again. And then we started going to that church. And like I said, I did my job so I didn't have to go to church with her. <laughs> Just as I started doing this, I finally had a point system. And whether it's your fault or not, they give you so many points, you get so many points, <clears throat> they would put you back on the dock. Uh, I had two accidents in two days. One of them was my fault, and one of them wasn't my fault, but they, they pointed me out, and because they liked me and because of my work that week, they put me as a supervisor on the dock working nights. Oh yeah, I was off on weekends then. I went to work Sunday night, get off on Saturday morning, and started going to church. But as we started going to church with her, I would drop her and the boys off, and they would go in and I'd go, I'll go find parking. And I would hit my pipe before going into church. Now I would put a shirt and tie on and cleaned up pretty good to play the part. And I would do this for a while. And the preacher would preach. And I would help her, why are you telling him about what, what's going on in our lives? Why are you telling him about me? Eventually I went forward. And the song was playing just as I am without one plea. I went forward and I know Don said, God, you know what? You said, you accept me for who I am right now. Here I am. I'm not going to change. If you want me to change, you have to change me. Don't challenge God like that. You <laughs> will do <laughs> And so, he did. He started changing me. Started working. And Growing up in the valley, you know, uh, I didn't smoke cigarettes, but weed was a whole different thing. I, I smoked them like cigarettes, and we grew our own. And so you have to be careful because the Bible says, make no provision for the flesh. I had like a almost a half pound up in the closet, and I said, I need to get rid of that. And I did, one zigzag back at a time, one paper at a time. And one day I came home from work in the morning, I started a fire, and I went to the closet, and I threw all my weed in there. Neighbors were happy. I was sad for a little bit. But... <laughs> but you gotta be careful. You share your story. And so she, hey, the alarm's going off. It's just Jeff, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, I bet that was Robert, wasn't it? I know, I'll be watching this live on Facebook. So, we started teaching junior church. Vicki did, and I started helping her. We started a bus ministry. We started with uh, four of us. My wife, myself, and the two boys went out knocking doors in the one ways in Norwalk. Got this bus donated to us. It's from Fred C. Nell's, if you guys know where that's at, detention center in Whittier. And this old beat up bus, we wrote Friendly Fuel Baptist on the ground, knocking doors. We started off with four. The next week we had eight. It doubled till we had 168 kids and adults coming on that bus. Two trips. And you, if you've ever been down the one ways, you know it was a good night because, you know, the cars are parked like this on the curb. It was amazing what God did for us. If you just align. Then I announced my call to preach. I was a youth pastor. I liked kids because they were real and honest. If they, if they didn't like you, they'd say, you suck. <laughs> People say, oh, you're the best. And then they stab you in the back, adults, you know. But that's okay. I don't do it for People. See, when I went forward, I said, God, you've got to change me because I'm not going to change. But he did. He did change me. I was going to play a, a video this morning. It's called Thank You for Giving to the Lord by Ray Bolts. And uh, an amazing video. 
But if someone wouldn't have been praying for me, nothing would ever happen. See, if we go back, I didn't tell you this part of it. When she was going back to church, she would get up in the middle of the night, slide over to a little sewing room next to our room and start crying and praying. Oh, Lord, save Donnie. Donnie, play, Lord, please touch Donnie. Get him off of drugs. Get him out of the lifestyle. Get him. And then, you know, I could shut the door. I could put the pillow over my head. And then all of a sudden, she quit going in the room. She just slid off the bed and started praying. I, oh, now I can't get away from this. <laughs> Folks, what I'm saying is you need to start praying for people. Start crying out for people. And the part of the song says, When I dream, I went to heaven. And all of a sudden, people started coming up to him and said, Thank you for giving the Lord. You'll never know who you touch until you tell your story. God is in the delivery business, He is the healing business, He is resurrection business. He can restore what the locusts eat. So the truth is this. Acts chapter 20 verse 24 says, Life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned to me by the Lord. What is that work? The work of telling the others the good news about God's mighty love and kindness. That's what it's all about. Can you imagine getting to heaven one day and someone runs, you don't know me. But... When I was eight, you taught my Sunday school class. And you would say a prayer. And one day I asked Jesus in my heart. One day me and my family were struggling, and you were there for us. One day you gave money to a missionary because his pictures broke your heart. See, you may not be able to go on the mission field, but you can help support the missions. There's a lot of things you can do. I make no apology for my lifestyle that I was, but I do praise God for who I am. See, through all that nonsense that I did and, and was good at, is nothing to what God has done for me now. He's brought me here now to tell you that He loves you. He died for you. Jesus died for you. And He's coming again for you. If you just receive Him. Eternity is real. And what we're going through now is nothing. There's going to be a great divide. Can you imagine someone standing on that great divide on one side and looking across and see you and start pointing their finger at you and say, you knew. You knew. And you didn't tell me about Jesus. You knew what it would take to get to heaven. You knew how to get there. And you didn't share it with me. Didn't you care about me? Didn't you love me enough to tell me? Will you take this challenge today of why and yield yourself to God and bring the good news to others? Because eternity is real. It is pointed a man once to die and then judgment is a second death. There's old saying, man born once, dies twice. Man born twice, dies once. And death is a separation. Either we're going to live in the arms, like Lazarus, in the bosom of our Savior, or we're going to be like the rich man. A great divide. It's your choice this morning. Realize I'm not God. Earnestly believe and exist that God exists and I matter to Him. And He has the power to help me recover. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ, care and control. Openly examine and confess my faults to myself and to God and to someone I trust. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects evaluate all my relationships offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for harm I've done to others except for when to do so would harm others reserve a daily time with God 
for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and His will for my life and to gain the power to follow His will. Yield myself to God. Yield myself to God to be used to bring the good news to others, both my, by my example and by my words. Will you help me walk in recovery? Will you walk in recovery with me? Because it's a life-changing decision. And it is a lifelong walk. We're not done. We're just getting started. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for the day you've given us the opportunity to, to serve you, Father, to go through this the last eight weeks. What an amazing journey it's been. What an amazing time it's going to be. Lord, as we all are now knowing that we have hurts, habits, and hangups, and we got issues, we got character defects, but we want to yield to you, Lord. We want you to fall upon us that we might be able to share our story, to reach somebody for eternity, to change their lives, to minister to them. Father, I thank you for my wife who loved me enough to cry out to you. I thank you that she would not give up. I thank you that she just continued to pour her heart out as she does for our family still this day. She pleads your blood over our family. And for that I am so thankful. Lord, I'm thankful that you took out the heart of stone and put a heart of flesh. That you gave me empathy and compassion. A desire to minister and to, to, to love people for who they are, where they're at. My job is not to change anybody, Lord. My job is just to point them to you and let you change them. And Father, I ask you right now to let us all have that job. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy might. And love thy neighbor as thyself. That is the two commandments. And let us live those out from this point forward. Let us walk on this road of recovery together until you call us home. Or until you declare time no more. Either way, Lord, we're going to thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. God bless you. Uh, those who are going to help out, see uh, Keith. Uh, he has maps how to get to uh, Patricia's house. Uh, I'd love for that many hands make a load light. If you've got a little bit of time, we'd like for you to go over there. It won't take us very long. Uh, Monday night, celebrate recovery, 7 o'clock. Tuesday night, Genesis. With